Excellent. Uh, hello, my name is Stephen Cretney, and I'm with the West Kootenai Climate Hub. The Climate Hub brings together various local organizations and individuals to accelerate climate action in our region. Uh, we are a volunteer-driven hub that facilitates connections and collaborations, including hosting these monthly webinars. Today, Greg Utsik is going to be joining us. Greg is a conservation ecologist and land use planning consultant based in Nelson. He has over 40 years experience in environmental impact assessment, watershed analysis, terrain and vegetation mapping, habitat inventory and modeling, and a wide range of activities related to forest management, biodiversity protection, and climate change adaptation. Greg is presently on the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, working with the BC government and First Nations on advising the Columbia Basin Treaty Negotiation Team. Greg, it is so nice to have you with us today to talk about the Columbia River Treaty. Welcome. You can take over, Greg, and uh, share your okay. share when you're ready. Okay. We're good. Excellent. Yep. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot for uh, organizing this presentation. And I just want to be really clear, it's not about the Columbia River Treaty specifically, but it's about climate change and the Columbia River Treaty. And I'll be talking principally about potential impacts of climate change and how they may interact with the treaty. Um, and I'll also want to acknowledge that uh, Ryan McDonald at work, this is a Summary of some other presentations that have been made in Ryan McDonald from McDonald uh, Hydrology has also uh, worked on some of this work. Um, okay, and basically, what is the uh, goal for the presentation? Well, I'm going to talk about changes, predicted changes, projected changes in temperature and precipitation in the basin, ch potential changes in stream flow, how this may affect ecosystems to some extent, and anadromous fish, potential for extreme events and variations across the basin because not all the basin is changing in the same way, and how climate change is being considered in the Columbia River Treaty Analysis Framework that's being uh, done here in BC. Um, so first of all, given that lots of people seem to have their own facts about climate, I think it's really important to note where the information presented here is coming from. It's uh, all based on scientific information, not the uh, kind of random things you can pick off the web. Uh, most of the climate data comes from uh, Climate North America, which is freely available. Um, and it's based on modeling that was used in the <laughs> IPCC analyses, the regional anal the analysis number five and analysis number six. Um, the flow data, a lot of it is based on work that was done in the United States by the RMJOC, which is made up of the Bonneville Power Authority, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Bureau of Land Management, and subsequently some modeling that has been done here in BC as well. So whenever we talk about climate change and future projections, the first thing we need to think about is what are our assumptions about what's going to happen in terms of greenhouse gas emissions into the future. And this is a map put out a couple of years ago, which shows basically the way in which greenhouse gas emissions have changed over the previous decades. And as you see, in some parts of the world, they're pretty well leveling off, and in other parts of the world, they're growing rapidly. So we need to, we don't really know where we're gonna end up in the next four or five decades. And the IPCC, the international uh, entity that's been looking at climate change has put out various projections uh, a couple of years ago and every couple of years they put out these gap reports which talk about what we're promising to do, what we're doing and what that may mean in the future. And if you look at where current policies are, they're kind of here in the middle. And these are the pledges that were made uh, during the uh, Copenhagen um, um, meeting a few years ago. 
And generally, we talk about these in terms of how many watts per square meter we will end up with at the end of these various changes in emissions. And we usually talk about a 4.5, which is assuming we're going to do more than we're doing now. Or we talk about 8.5, which is we do worse than we're doing now. And we figure the answer is going to be somewhere between those two. So those are the emission scenarios that I'll be assuming. Um, right now, we're somewhere in the middle of that. So if we look at these two emission scenarios, the 8.5, which is the one we assumes we keep growing our emissions, um, you can see that in the near term, this is for, sorry, I'm going to start out by saying this is looking at the upper Columbia River portion of the basin here in uh, in the Kootenays. Excuse me. And if we look at the near term, it doesn't matter which emission scenario we look at because those changes are already locked in. And we're looking at uh, increases in temperature between one and two degrees in the uh, immediate decades. And if we go out a bit further into the mid-century, we're looking at these two scenarios in changing in that the higher emission scenario, we end up with increases of up to four degrees in the summer and anywhere between two and three degrees in the other seasons. And these last sections are the average annual change. And as of course we go toward the end of the century, the two emission scenarios diverge dramatically. So we're looking at a minimum of, of two to three degrees in the future, assuming that we do a lot more about reducing our emissions than we're doing now. And if we actually make it worse, it could be anywhere from a four to six degree increase. <clears throat> and what <clears throat> what does this mean in terms of changes in precipitation? Well, this zero line assumes there'll be no change in the current precipitation. And by current, I mean the average over the last four or five decades. And if it's above the line, it's a projected increase. So we're looking at projected increases in winter precipitation, spring precipitation, and smaller increases in the fall and decreases in summer precipitation. And again, not much difference between the two emission scenarios because as I say, these changes are pretty well locked in. As we move out, you'll notice that actually in, in contrast to changes in precipitation, the differences in precipitation don't actually change very much depending on which scenario you choose. Basically precipitation overall, again, these being the annual averages increases with time. <clears throat> Summer precipitation generally decreases, but particularly more with a higher emission scenario. And winter, spring, and fall continue to increase into the future. And if we look at the Kootenai Lake portion <clears> of <throat> the Columbia Basin, the Kootenai, Kootenai River, the East Kootenai, it flows into the Kukanusa Reservoir, inflows into Kootenai Lake, the Duncan Reservoir, and down to the outlet of Kootenai Lake. The pattern is much the same, although the exact numbers are a bit different. So there's more increases in the near term. And then once you get out to at the end of the century, the changes are about the same as for the rest of the basin. So based on these, we've, in terms of an analysis for the looking at what changes may impact the treaty, we decided to look at the 8.5, the more drastic scenario, because in terms of precipitation and inflows, it doesn't really make much difference. And we are trying to look at <clears throat> what are the potential changes we want to look at, probably a worst case scenario anyway, so we will be looking at the 8.5 scenario. Now, in terms of inflows, it's a lot of work to convert climate projections into inflows into the reservoirs. And a fair bit of work had been done by this group in the United States about uh, six or eight years ago, and they created inflows for all the reservoirs in the Columbia Basin. So rather than reinvent the wheel, um, the choice was made to choose two of these scenarios that they had put together and run those. And we wanted to look at bookends as to what the future might look like. So we chose a particularly dry scenario, which ends up being this one. Uh, 
and we chose a wet one to look at the other extreme. And when you plot those in terms of precipitation for the upper Columbia, you can see this is the 8.5 that I presented before in the changes in precipitation. And you can see that the dry one is distinctly drier than that in general, and the wetter one is wetter, although it is a bit drier in the summer portion. And when you look at the annual differences, they do nicely bookend what the average projections are in the most recent projections. So it's a reasonable, if we look at these two possibilities, we can assume that the answer is probably between those two, but we don't know exactly where it's going to be. I could go into more detail about this if people want <clears throat> some more detail in the question period, but I'm trying to keep it pretty general. Um, but this gives you some background as to where the information is coming from. So what do these projections mean? Well, one of the most important things about um, future changes in the basin is the changes in the amount of snowfall. And as you can see, this is looking at three different reservoirs, the inflows to the Kimbasket Reservoir, the Revelstoke Reservoir, and the Arrow Reservoir, is that all of the projection, well, first of all, I'll start with these two green lines. You can see that the proportion of annual precipitation that came as snow between 1950 and 1980 was about 64, 62%, and it's already dropped to about 55%. And the projections into the future, all of them are reasonably consistent that it's going to continue to fall. And that's true for the inflows for the Revelstoke and even greater, of course, for the Arrow because it's further south and lower elevation in general. Um, and these are the 8.5, assuming we make things worse with increasing our greenhouse gas emissions. If we were to make a change and in fact reduce our gas greenhouse gas emissions substantially, these projections show that the impacts would improve. Um, we'd have less loss of snow than if we continue to increase our emissions. But in any case, no matter what we do, more than likely, it's going to continue to get worse. So what does this mean in terms of inflows into the basins? And what I've done is broken the uh, Columbia Basin into these three subdivisions. One is the inflows into the Kim Basket or the Mike, Micah Dam, the Revelstoke Dam, and then the Arrow, Hugh Kinley side dam, which is the Arrow Reservoir. And you can see these colors correspond here. So this is the amount of precipitation in these coming periods that will come in in the winter and spring in each of those portions of the Columbia Basin. And you can see historically, we're looking at about 25 million cubic meters on average per year in those months. And in the dry projection, again, even though it's a dry projection, it's still an increase in the annual or in the winter and spring amount of precipitation. And that is consistent with the uh, projections into the future for precipitation. And the wet one, it's a substantial increase in the amount of moisture that'll be there. And, but again, this is winter, spring. Um, in other words, snowpack as well as spring precipitation. And if we look at the summer changes, it's exactly the opposite direction. Historically, we were looking at this amount, eight or nine million cubic meters. Under the dry projection, that's reduced substantially, probably about 30%. And under the wetter projection, it's still produced, but to a let still reduced, but to a lesser extent, a lesser extent. And it seems to be pretty consistent among all these, although the total reduction is probably greatest in the Kim basket, partly because it is the largest part of the, the uh, watershed. And if we look at the uh, Kootenai Lake portion, the trends are pretty much the same. We can look at uh, what flows into Kukanusa, the East Kootenai portion of the, of the, of the uh, Kootenai Lake or Kootenai watershed. And then we can look at the direct inflows below the Libby Dam into Kootenai Lake. We can look at the Duncan Reservoir portion, and we can look at the lower part above the um, Coraline Dam, which is mainly the Slocan watershed. And you can see that all of these, again, increase both in the dry projection and the wet projection. And in the summer, we still get a similar trend, although I would say the dry projection for the Kootenai portion is significantly drier. Um, it looks like almost a 50% reduction in summer inflows 
whereas the wet projection, it's only a 20 or 30 percent. So the contrast between the projections are much greater in the, the Kootenai portion of the watershed. So what does this mean in potential water flows? Um, this is some modeling that was done here in BC using those inflows. And so the historic are basically 2028 to 2007 and the projected are 2020 to 2080. And this is looking at stream flow at Birch Blank, which is just north of trail. So it's the whole Kootenai and Columbia basins in Canada. And you can see the historic is that the flows decrease dramatically. Um, and in the spring, because we're holding back water and then the freshet occurs, and then we go into a low period in August, October, December. And if we look at the brown line, you can see the inflows in the spring and summer increase dramatically, uh, much greater than they would have been in historical periods, but they also then decrease way below what they've been in historical periods into the, the summer period, which is consistent with those inflows. So this is under current management of the dams. I think it's also important though, these, these hard lines and the dash line are the average over that historic period. But these here are the 10th to 90th percentiles. So you can see there's a lot more floods and potential for floods in the, in the wet, in the future projections. And you'll also notice, so those are much bigger You've also noticed that the peak has moved back much earlier in the spring because it's getting warmer and snow melts much earlier in the spring. This spring is, might be a good example of that. And lastly, you'll notice that there's significant decreases in low flows in the uh, later summer and fall. If we look at the drier projection, the trends are the same, but the amount of flooding is significantly decreased. You'll notice this one goes to 5,000, this graph and the upper one goes up to 8,000. So the, the scales are a bit different. And of course the drier one is much drier in the uh, summer and late spring, or sorry, summer and early fall. So you can see there's gonna be a dramatic difference in, in the future of the way the inflows and outflows go through the Columbia Basin in Canada. Earlier peaks, higher extreme peaks, higher average peaks, and decreased low flows. So what does climate change mean in terms of the ecosystems in the region? And I'm not going to dwell on this very much because we're concentrating more on things that might look at the Columbia River and the Columbia River Treaty. But we're looking at maybe one of the possible changes under the treaty is being able to grow more vegetation around the edges of the reservoirs. It's one of the scenarios that's being examined. And so we looked at dividing the reservoirs into their distinct climatic areas. The, the Kim Basket is divided into three areas, the Southern, the Mid and the Northern portion, which is uh, more subboreal. And we also look at dividing Arrow into Upper Arrow and Lower Arrow, Lower Arrow being much drier and warmer. And then Kukanusa, which is distinctly hotter and drier than other portions of the basin. And just to summarize what impact this is going to have on vegetation, this is a pretty complicated graph, but I'll go through it. So this is a climatic moisture index. And this is basically looking at the combination of how much evaporation demand there is in the summer during the growing season and how much precipitation and moisture is actually available to grow things. So if this number is greater than five, we're generally looking at closed forests. And as you can see, this is 1951 or 1921 to 1950, 51 to 80. So presently, Kin Basket and Upper Arrow and Duncan are clearly all closed forests, as we all know. And looking at into the future, they're going to remain so. But if you look at uh, this green one here, which is Lower Arrow, sort of south of Fouquier, um, in the 1920s to 1950s, we know it was much hotter and drier. And in fact, it was open forest, savanna, steppe grassland. And more recently, 
it has become much closer to uh, mixed open forest. And if you look at the uh, Syringa Park area, they're doing some uh, burns in there right now to open up that forest and make it what it would have been naturally was more of a savanna type. But in the future, it's probably to degrade into complete grasslands that we're likely to lose all the forest cover. Same being true in Kukanusa. If you look at the area in the southern East Kootenays, it's open forest and grassland. Tobacco plains are really grasslands. And those areas are going to become much more intensive and much more semi-arid into the future. So that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of terrestrial reservoirs, because we're kind of concentrating on the, the aquatic environment today. But there's going to be big changes in the terrestrial components around these reservoirs as well. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is that we've been talking about average changes in temperature and precipitation. And if that was all that was happening with climate change, basically we take this bell curve where we had average, lots of average temperatures, a few cold, dry ends, few on the hot, dry end, and we just move this distribution frequency curve over to the right. It would get hotter, we'd have lots more hot and whatever. But the way in which climate change is working, it's not the only thing that's happening. We're also changing the shape of that curve, which means we're getting a lot more variability and a lot less what we would call normal or average climate. And I think if you just think about the last five years, it's, it's pretty clear that's what's happening. So what happens in that situation? We still get cold weather, but not as much as we used to get. And the uh, cold spell we had for a week in uh, January last year was a really good example of that. Those were extreme cold temperatures. We still get those just not as often as we used to. We get a lot less of the, what we call normal weather and a lot more hot weather than we got before. And then a whole bunch of record hot weather, which we've never seen before. And that's usually out here on the tails is where bad things happen. And we need to really think about that. And a lot of the climate modeling and a lot of projections in the future don't talk about these extremes. And just to give you a couple examples of that, I'm not going to go into detail. I have in some other presentations, but a lot of things are driven by changes in the jet stream. Jet stream used to just wander across North America and move storms and weather patterns through. Now it's starting to do these big wobbles. And these are what bring on these extremes. This is late June last year, or in 2021, sorry, a couple of years ago, where we had the heat dome. This was, excuse me, the jet stream configuration during that time. It's combined with a high pressure that compressed that air and kept that hot air in there. And so the temperature anomaly compared to the end of the last century, we're looking at temperatures that were 15 to 20 degrees above what we would have considered normal during that period of time. And of course, that had some tremendous impacts. Lytton was burned to the ground. This was a picture of Four Mile Beach during that time. We suffered from that as well. This is a thermometer on my back porch during those uh, that heat dome. Um, it was hot. <laughs> this was considered to be a one in 1,000 year event, but 150 times more likely because of climate change. And if we if and when we get to two degrees of warming, which we're already approaching 1.5, this kind of event could be, rather than being a one in 1,000 year event, something that happens every five to 10 years within the next few decades. So it's these extremes that we really need to keep our head wrapped around. This was another example of that. This is the jet, this is only six months later in November of 2021. This was the uh, atmospheric river that came into the coast. This is a radar image of the weather pattern coming in. That little star is hope. This is the uh, satellite image of that storm track coming in during that period, mid-November 2021. And again, this resulted <laughs> in one of the most expensive disasters in British Columbia's history with flooding in Abbotsford, lots of washouts on the Columbia, or sorry, on the Coquihalla Highway. And the amount of precipitation in some cases, east of Hope, west of Hope, was over 400 millimeters in a two day period, which is uh, quite unprecedented. But an atmospheric river, which we used to call pineapple expresses when they weren't quite so nasty, um, had a magnitude of one in 10 year event, but 60% more likely because of climate change. 
the due day precipitation was a one in the 50 or one in a hundred year event, but 50% more likely because of climate change. The extreme flow was two to four times more likely, which created all these flooding damages. And it was also contributed by wet soils and rain on snow. And rain on snow events are also something that's likely become more common with climate change. So there's other impacts of just the increase in temperatures that we need to think about. One of the things that's been talked a lot about with regard to the Columbia River Treaty, although the Columbia River Treaty didn't wipe out salmon in the Columbia Basin, um, it was the uh, dams in the United States that were built in the 1940s that wiped out salmon. But increasing climate change is increasing risk to salmon in the Columbia. And if we want to return salmon to the upper Columbia Basin. These are things we need to contend with now because of increasing climate change. This table summarizes the impacts on migrating salmon as they're coming up with changes in temperature in the rivers that they're migrating in. And you can see once you reach 22 degrees, most sockeye die. Um, Chinooks are already having significant problems. And by the time you get to 23, 24 degrees, basically most salmon species are dead. Um, but even as low as 20 degrees, you're getting increased disease, heat, heat stress, loss of energy, and they have much more difficult migrating. So let's look at a particular example. This is the year 2015. These are the normal changes in temperature. This is the 20 degree temperature up here. You can see in 2015, in the early part of the year, this is June, July, temperatures jumped up dramatically. And as to point out this table is based on reality, this is what happened that year. Again, it's a bit of a complex graph. This is that 18 degree where salmon and other anadromous species start to be stressed. This is 21 degrees where mortality increases dramatically. And this is 23 degrees where they basically, most of them die. <clears throat> this was the temperature in the weeks leading up to this peak here, and you can see how the temperature increases. These bar graphs are the amount of survivals in the Columbia River during that time. The blue one is the upper Columbia, which would be stuff that, for instance, goes into the Okanagan. The Snake River runs. This is very interesting. The brown one is Snake River salmon that migrated on their own. And these are ones that are trans, sorry. that uh, were transported in trucks, which is what's being looked at in the possible restoration of salmon to get them around the dams. So you can see that the sockeye in the upper Columbia started to die off even as temperatures only reached, um, what are we at here, 18, 19 degrees. And then as temperatures increased up to 22, 23 degrees, the amount of sockeye surviving was down 10, five very small percentages. And if we look at the ones that are from the Snake River, you can see that the ones that were natural runs in the, in the brown did better than the ones that had been transported. And it's felt that the ones that are transported are not imprinted well on the river that they're returning to because they've been doing part of the river in a truck rather than in the river and they wander around and they end up spending more time in that hot water than the ones that, that go naturally. So these are the kind of things that we need to be contending with now if we're talking about returning salmon to the upper Columbia. Is it feasible given the projections for changes in temperature? Some of the work that's being done in the United States in those stretches of the river, this is the present average temperatures in the lower Columbia. And you can see that this is the threshold at which salmon become stressed. This is the threshold in which they begin to die with high percentages. And already we're in that category in much of the year. And all these different colors are streams that are flowing into the Columbia, which are either colder or in the case of the ones that are above this line are warmer than the Columbia. And these colder ones offer refuges where the salmon can stop on their way up here and go into these side streams and get into cooler water and wait and hope that, in fact, the Columbia itself will cool down. But these are the projections of where the temperatures are going to be in the 2080s um, in August. And as you can see, the temperatures 
move up into this death zone and all the full distance. And this is, as you move from left to right, is as you go up the Columbia. So the upper portion of the Columbia is better than the lower portion. But if they're going to re return to the Pacific, they have to go through the lower portion as well. And as you can see, there's very few streams that are below the uh, ideal temperature for salmon and andres. Right now, the United States is looking at creating, identifying these cold water refuges. They've so far already are closing fishing in those areas because basically the salmon become sitting ducks in those cold water refuges. Um, and they've identified all the different streams and the potential temperatures. But you can see this is present situation. This is a future situation. You see a lot more orange and red, which are the higher temperatures and less and less refuges that are available for salmon. So this is another impact on it. The other thing to think about is that the whole Columbia Basin is not changing the same way. So this is taking the whole Columbia Basin, including the US portion, and dividing it into sub-basins. And the important point here in terms of the treaty is DALS, which is just above Portland, which is what we use as the reference point for the Columbia River Treaty in terms of flooding, because a lot of the point of the Columbia River Treaty was reduced flooding in Portland and downstream portions of the Columbia. So this is looking at projections in floods in the spring in the future. And these two are the sub-basins. This is the Kootenai sub-basin, and this is the Upper Columbia Basin in Canada. And you can see the projection for the Upper Columbia, and this is the 8.5, the worst emission scenario. The Upper Columbia increases in the likelihood of spring floods. Whereas the Kootenai portion holds level or maybe slightly decreases. And on this map, the ones that are in orange and brown and red are areas where there are decreases in flooding potential and the Oli. So you'll notice that most of the US portion of the basin, in fact, decreases in the amount of flooding potential, mainly because they lose snow. Um, so the spring freshet just is not as dramatic an impact, whereas the snake has much higher elevation. And of course, we're wetter in Canada in general. There are two basins where they increase, one being the snake in the US, moderate increase, and of course ours in the upper Columbia is increasing as well as I showed in the earlier slides. If we compare the two, this is now looking, this is the same graph and maps we were just looking at, and this is looking at the lesser emission scenario. Um, you can see the trends are pretty much the same, but the trends are much more dramatic with the higher emission scenario. But one important thing that comes out of this is the only basin that actually reverses in the lower emission scenario, flooding increases in the Kootenays because we're still getting a fair bit of snow or in the uh, Kootenay portion of the basin, Canadian basin, whereas under the high emissions scenario, it actually decreases. So it's a matter that under the higher emission scenario, we cross the threshold where we're getting significantly less snow and therefore these spring freshets are less of an issue. Um, this is the outflow projection at the Dell. So this would be the culmination of all the watersheds. Under the low emission scenario, there's a slight increase in flooding potential, but under the high emission scenario, the actual amount of flooding decreases dramatically. So the reason I'm showing all these is to show there's a lot of uncertainty. We're not exactly sure what's going to happen. And a lot of it depends on what we decide to do about emissions. This is looking at just total runoff, not storms, but just the total amount of water. And you can see that both emission scenarios, the amount of water that's coming out of the basin during the summer is dramatically decreased. And if you look at the high emission scenario, it's increased way more, but there's also a huge increase in uncertainty about these projections. So again, it's it's unclear. So flooding may go up, but the total amount of water available may go down, which has interesting impacts because as climate change increases, we decrease our need for electricity in the winter and increase our need for electricity in the summer. If there's going to be a lot less flow in the summer, that doesn't bode well. 
Um, this is some modeling that we did looking at the whole Columbia Basin. Um, we've set a limit in terms of trying to control flooding by the way we manage the dams to keep it below 4,500 4,500,000 4, cubic feet per second. And it appears we're capable of doing that in both scenarios, but the number of floods that bump up against that increases dramatically. The green being past historical inflows and the orange being uh, future climate change ones. And you can see there's obviously less under the dry, but again, the peaks move earlier in the year. We're still looking at lower flows in the spring and fall, particularly under the dry one, or sorry, summer and fall. Um, one interesting thing comes out of looking at the whole basin is that there's a drainage here in the lower one called the Willamette River, which has quite large flows compared to the rest of the basin, but it has a huge increase in the amount of winter floods. And the reason for that is it's coastal and it probably loses most of its snow. And therefore when winter precip comes rather than being stored as snow and contributing to the spring freshet, it runs off right then and there. And this actually potentially offers the possibility of winter flooding in Portland rather than spring and summer flooding in Portland, which is a big contrast to the historical thing. Um, this happened once before in the 1990s. And in that particular situation, the United States actually called on Canada to store water in the winter to reduce the risk of flooding there. But this may be something in the future. And so far, this hasn't been contemplated in the treaty at all the only call for flooding is actually associated with the spring freshet. So there's some interesting points for discussion. So how are we using this information? Well, rather than just looking at, we have a, a model, a flow model that we're using called CRTPM, Columbia River Treaty uh, Analysis. Um, usually, normally, it's just been looking at historic inflows, but we're looking at these two future scenarios as well. So we're now looking at three different types of inflows and looking at what the reaction is. And we're putting in particular scenarios, certainly the current management. We're also looking at other things we might consider the future, improved ecosystem function, or maybe trying to include floodplain repair and wetland vegetation around the reservoirs. And then looking at what we call performance measures. How do these scenarios under these three different inflows affect these different values? Is habitat restored? Are the recreational values maintained or improved? Is reservoir productivity for fisheries improved or get worse? Is there more flooding? Is there salmon migration potential or not? And the outputs, there's three sets of outputs based on these three different inflows. And we have a number of scenarios performance measures, the red being they, they're bad or worse, yellow, not much change, green, they get better. And we're looking at how those change under these three different scenarios. In other words, is a scenario robust through historic and future possibilities? Or if not, you go back and revise the scenario and try and figure out a way to improve it. And if it's good, then it's a potential management consideration for future management. And will changes to the treaty make that future management possible. So what are the main takeaways? Climate change is happening. There's changes in seasonality for all the projections, drier summers, wetter in other seasons, less snow, more rain, earlier snow melt, extreme events are increasing in frequency and magnitude. Annual inflow and projections vary. The wet scenario, significant annual increases, dry as minor increases, all project lower summer flows. Impacts in the US or Canada are different. There's lots of uncertainty, increased winter flooding in the lower Columbia. And I think a general thing about climate change is that stationarity is dead. Changes will increase over time. Rapidly reducing our emissions could reduce future impacts, especially loss of snow and frequency and magnitude of flooding. Scenario evaluation, the analysis being done here in Canada includes climate change assessments. We're looking at future possibilities as kind of like a stress test on any assumptions we make. Most projections don't capture extreme events. So we're looking at more extreme projections and I think that's a wise choice. 
planning and operations, there's potential for increased flood risk, particularly in Canada, and there's increased fl inflow variability. It'll make planning much more complicated and seasonal operations will be much more variable. And obviously what's happened over the last summer is a good example of that. And embrace uncertainty, expect the unexpected. And the only graph that really matters in terms of climate change is this one here, the increase in carbon concentration in the atmosphere. We need to flatten that graph. So, and that concludes the presentation. By the way, this graph here shows we're at this year. These are the last 50 years, well, 80 years actually. 2023 was off the chart and 2024 is still off the chart. Okay. So nice you ended on such a happy note there, Greg. Uh, um. <laughs> I don't think happiness uh, is what we need to think about. It's what our responsibility is, is what we need to think about. Yes. Um, so I, I have a question to start off the question and period, and it's actually kind of around that, what you just said there about your responsibility. I, I'm wondering about your role in this, in your, as an advisor, um, to this negotiation. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering in that role, what kind of influence does your input have, or, or what is kind of the, the uptake of what you're bringing to those negotiations or, or to the people who are doing the negotiations, like are, is it being received well and therefore then potential for those negotiations to bring that kind of thing in, you know? Um, well, I might just say that I really probably have little or no influence on the negotiations themselves between the Canadian and BC governments and first nations and the United States. I'm not privy to those in detail. What I'm part of is a team of people, and I should emphasize the word team, which are trying to provide background information for the people who are actually in the negotiations. And this kind of climate change information is one piece of information that they need to think about when they're negotiating. We need to be able to negotiate a treaty that allows Canada the flexibility it needs to deal with these changes in the future and make sure that any commitments we make are consistent with what the impacts of climate change will be in the future. We don't wanna tie ourselves down to something that's not gonna work once climate change begins to intensify. So I would say that this presentation is kind of a summary of the input that's been given to the, the Canadian negotiating team. And they certainly are aware of it and have taken it on. So I, I would say yes. Um, I'm also, my other portion, which I didn't really talk about here, is I'm working with a number of other people looking at ways to improve vegetation around the reservoirs, and that definitely is being looked at very seriously in terms of potential changes subsequent to a new treaty. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say right now that if anyone has any questions, they can raise their hand or put um, uh, put your question into the chat. There is a question from uh, John who's wondering, um, and the, his comments in in the chat uh, compliments you on on everything and 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 says the government sure has their work cut out for them. But he's to get to the actual question part from your perspective. What is the most important thing we can do as individuals to inspire and support the change we need to see? I think to uh, use every power you have to lobby with government to get them to act. Sure, we can do things ourselves. You know, you can buy an electric car. You can put a heat pump on your house. There's nothing wrong with doing that. That definitely is good. But all of us doing that isn't going to stop the greenhouse emissions coming from Canada. Most of them are coming from industrial operations and it takes government support and government action to deal with that. And I think that, you know, the, the climate hub and the, the climate lobby is important. We need to be talking to our representatives and get them to act, to take this information seriously. I cannot agree more. Um, well, that's the only question. Does anyone else have a question 
if they want to. Uh, oh, I'm interested in the time frame uh, for the negotiation process. <laughs> Uh, I can't answer that question. Um, let's just say there are, I believe, from the updates that we've had at CBRAC, is that uh, there are some things that are agreed to in principle. There are some things that the negotiation teams are still far apart on. And until there's um, proposals coming from uh, both parties that are acceptable to the other side, the negotiations are not going to move forward. And to date, they haven't been moving very well. Yeah, these things do take all, take long, don't they? Um, Keith has asked, uh, what is the balance of values taken into account? Flood control, electricity production, and ecosystem improvement? Does the need for electricity production trump other important management objectives? Um, I would say... In the past, when the treaty was negotiated in the 1960s and late 50s, there were only two things that were taken into account. One was electricity production and the other was flood control. And that was it. There is nothing else in the treaty that has a value. Now, particularly on the Canadian side, the situation has changed dramatically. The negotiating committee is made up of representatives from the provincial government, the federal government, and three First Nations. The three First Nations have values that are very different and go way beyond flood control and electricity production. And in addition to that, the provincial government um, has brought in other players to participate. I'm actually there representing a consortium of uh, environmental groups. Um, there's also a committee of local government officials, and they are also participating in advising the government and in uh, the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, there are citizen representatives of all the communities throughout the basin, and they also have input. So I would say, yes, there is a good cross-section. And I didn't list all the performance measures, but it's a very long list, and it attempts to include all the things that we value here in the Columbia Basin, in the Canadian portion of the basin. Nice. Uh, Mo has asked in the chat, how can we get randomness factored into planning? And do you think there is a paradigm shift happening where people realize they really do not have all the facts? And I'd say can't have all the facts because of even in your presentation saying that everything shifts. So um, how can we or they work with with this new paradigm? I think that's one of the biggest challenges dealing with climate change is to get to people to recognize that uncertainty is increasing rapidly. And everybody wants certainty. I mean, you know, when you leave the house in the morning, you want to know whether it's going to rain or not. And that decides whether you take your umbrella. But if you embrace uncertainty, you might take your umbrella anyway. It depends on your risk tolerance. Is 20% rain enough to take your 20% uh, chance of rain enough to take your umbrella? Or do you need to see a 60% chance? It's convincing managers to begin to look at risk in a reasonable way and uh it's it's a very uphill battle nobody wants to talk about risk or randomness um i i don't have an answer i it's yeah. i think you just it's a real problem because as soon as you start saying we don't really know then people could start questioning it and saying well if you don't really know we can disregard mm -hmm. what you're saying um, it's a fine balance between embracing uncertainty and also trying to figure out what things are certain and what things pose a high enough risk that you don't care about uncertainty. It's worth avoiding them no matter how uncertain it is. Yeah, that is definitely, definitely something. And we've heard that even yesterday at the RDCK level. Um, Marcy had asked, in the chat, do our current dams in the Columbia Basin have enough capacity to hold larger volumes of water anticipated in the winter, spring, and ability to hold it for summer when there is more drought? Um, well, yes and no. Um, once we get to these extreme events, they may not. I mean, you have to think back to uh, 2013 and the Kootenai system is the best example. Um, Basically, the amount of water in the flood space that they maintain in the dams 
is based on a projection of what the summer spring and summer precipitation is going to be and what the snowpack is and what happened in 2012 in the kootenai system was it was a normal snowpack things were pre proceeding normally they emptied the reservoirs in anticipation of the snowpack melting it was melting they started filling the reservoirs and normally they fill by you know mid-july but what happened was the june certainly around Kootenai Lake was a, one of the wettest on records. It was four times the normal precipitation in June. And all at once, there wasn't enough space left in the reservoir. And we ended up with significant flooding around Kootenai Lake in 2012. Um, it's not a matter of whether there's enough space. It's whether we have planned to use that space when we need it. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that under extreme conditions, no, there may not be enough space under normal conditions, yes but whether we plan and use it according to what is going to happen in the next months is another question. And just a little follow up on that then is what, what is the time needed for, or, and you might not be able to answer this, but like how much planning does need to be and how much forward thinking month, two months to be able to determine, well, Oh the, geez, it's going to be a wet June. We better change well, what we're doing. The way the, way the uh, planning and under the treaty works is that, the U.S. entities, BC Hydro and the Army Corps of Engineers and BPA, get together and formulate a five-year operating plan, and they update that every year. So there's that ongoing five years ahead. And then there's a four-year, a three-year, a two-year, and then a one-year actual operating plan for that year. And they begin actually projecting flows on the 1st of January of what they think the flow at the Dells will be. And, the de and they have certain curves that decide how much water is stored when in each dam based on that anticipation, and they update that every month. But I had previously done some analysis on that, and it's pretty good, but it's not perfect, mainly because you can get things like I explained about 2012, mm -hmm. where you get the unexpected rainfall, the unexpected hot period, where snow melts very rapidly. It's it's an art and a science. And uh, yeah, things can go wrong, particularly when you have extreme events. Wow. Um, Graham asks an interesting question. He's heard that uh, in general, societies increase collaboration when under minor stress, but fragment and fall apart once stress exceeds a certain level. So do you have any thoughts on how we can keep <laughs> it together as a society to get things done together as this uh, proceeds well first of all trust the science and don't trust what you read on the internet um <laughs> um i don't know i think that uh, the kind of process that i believe is going on in terms of planning for the columbia river treaty and the negotiations in canada is a good start to that it's trying to put everything on the table look at all the options and come to some logical conclusions. Um, but we're only half of the equation. The discussion in the United States is very different. If you look at the kinds of things that they put forward that they wanted to get out of this treaty, it was basically we want everything and we don't want to pay anything for what Canada does. Um, that's not yeah. a logical conclusion. Um, there's lots of things that are contradictory in the United States. There's so many players. There's, what, five, six states involved in the Columbia Basin. There's uh, power entities, not just one, but a whole bunch of them. Um, there's First Nations who are particularly interested in returning salmon and other values. And there's irrigators and there's electricity production. Um, there's lots of potential for stress. And I think that's a very good question but I think having good planning and good participation, meaningful participation is probably the only thing that's going to make that happen. Nice. Uh, Heath asked another question. Was the record low level of water in the Arrow Lakes last season the result of drought or maintaining flows for electricity production or both? Um, well, both, but without drought, it wouldn't have happened. But last year was a very unusual drought situation for British Columbia. British Columbia, about 40, 45% of the electricity in British Columbia is produced on the Columbia system, on, you know, on the, uh, principally on the Micah and Revelstoke dams, but also the Arrow to some extent, and the dams on the Kootenai. 
Um, the other 45% comes from the Peace River system, which is in mid to northern BC. And normally, historically, if it's wet in the Columbia system, it might be drier in the Peace. If it's wet in the Peace, it might be drier in the Columbia. And they offset each other. And BC Hydro very carefully balances where they produce electricity at any given moment. Last year was extremely unusual in the sense that there was drought in both areas. So not only was Arrow Lakes down, I was in the Peace River country last fall looking at the river, the last thing before they flooded that last section under the Peace River Dam. But I went up to Williston Reservoir and it was also down about 20 feet and it was normally full at that time of the year. So it reduces BC Hydro's options of what they can do. They could have, they can potentially move water out of the Kimbasket Reservoir to keep Arrow up higher. But last year they couldn't afford to do that because they weren't gonna, they didn't have a lot of water to produce electricity in the piece. And you need to store enough water in Kimbasket and in the piece to anticipate the winter. So dumping that water into Arrow would have meant producing electricity when it was worthless during the summer, or it would have meant producing no electricity to keep Arrow up. And then in the winter being unprepared for a cold stretch like we had, like it's, it's a tricky balance. Um, so in that sense, Arrow was down because of electricity production, not necessarily production out of Arrow or production in the states below Arrow, but because you couldn't afford to put the water in there to keep it up because you wanted to save it for electricity production in the winter. Wow. But it was the drought that drove that, really. Well, we're at the top of the hour, so I'd like to thank you, Greg, for not only a, a great presentation, but also answering these questions so thoroughly. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming and, and thanks everyone for joining and, and asking such thoughtful questions. Um, we will be doing a follow-up, uh, email with some resources and a link to the recording once it's, once it's posted. So you can watch it again and again. Um, yes. Thank you all. And, uh, I hope to see you at a, a webinar in May, May 17th. <laughs> thank you.